What is going on, everybody? Welcome into Studs and Duds, the most comprehensive NFL player review series on the internet. My name is Marcus Whitman, and today we're going to be going through the risers and fallers for each team in the NFL from weeks five and six. And there are timestamps in the description below if you want to hop around from team to team. It is also important to note that you will be seeing ratings changes in this video, and those ratings do stem from my own custom Madden roster. My roster has been the number one most downloaded community roster since 2016. And do not worry, I have not missed a game yet this season. And the ratings you see in this video do accurately show my own perceptions of these players in real life. So if you enjoy this video or my roster update each week, this is my most ambitious undertaking. Looking like about 16 hours to put this whole thing together here this week. So if you enjoy, I do ask that you please do leave a like down below, really helps me out. Also, share this video with your friends and family who are football fans that you think would enjoy. And lastly, do consider endorsing this project both the video and my Madden roster. You can do it directly through my PayPal or my Venmo, links right there and in the descriptions or via patreon.com slash that franchise guy where you will also get exclusive weekly content from me. And without further ado, let's get into studs and duds, starting with our star of the week. Really no surprise, it is going to be Derrick Henry, the king of the running game, running back for the Tennessee Titans. And with Henry, I've for some reason always kind of held it against him that he's not amazing in the receiving game and he's not overly elusive in space and he really doesn't do things like other running backs are supposed to do it. But I really think it's reached the point where that is the wrong way to look at this thing. And even like his efficiency per carry isn't amazing and still I don't think that applies to Derrick Henry he really is different where you give him 30 carries you know that he takes a little bit longer to get started you know that he's not going to do all of these little things and he is a little bit of a one trick horse not a pony you can't call Derrick Henry a pony that's just not not doing him justice but you just know that at some point if he gets that lane it's not just a 20 yard run. It's not just a 10 yard run. It is a 70, 60 yard touchdown run that changes the landscape of games. And he does seem to get better as the game goes on. He has this unique style. He is officially one of the best running backs to ever play the game. He's on pace for a second straight 2000 yard season. He has all of the stamina in the world. He doesn't get injured like other running backs, knock on wood, but I think that's because of his size and style. He really is one of the best players in the NFL and deserves to be rated as a 99 overall. And there you go, plus 495 to a 99. The star of the week, Derrick Henry, steamrolling the Buffalo Bills for a big win for the Titans this week, taking on the Chiefs this week as well. And then our dud of the week, and you could really say dud of the season here for Landon Collins, because he has now dropped three straight weeks in a row down to a 77. You know, Landon Collins was once viewed as one of the premium safeties in the league, and it was at a time, you know, 2017. He was a rangy, you know, deep safety, making plays down the field, and that just couldn't be any further from what he brings to the table nowadays and and the the Washington football team is really struggling to figure out how to use him in fact Ron Rivera has now kind of said I think you're a linebacker Landon Collins so maybe he has a position change he does have the size to play linebacker in the modern game but very clearly is not a free safety at least at this point in time I mean he just does not move as well in space he doesn't have those coverage instincts and Really, if you look at his career, it, it you can point to that one all-pro season that led to him getting a massive contract here for Washington and say that was an outlier on his career. And man, are the Washington football team overpaying Landon Collins at this point, who just hasn't been an impact for them. So down to a 77, I mean, he is basically a bandit linebacker safety at this point in time that it's just, you know, that you can find a spot for a player like that. Uh, and he could turn this thing around, but it's just not a, a very valuable position because there are a lot of players like this that can be found that don't cost you $15 million a year like Landon Collins. So it's been a really rough season for Landon and honestly has been a point of attack for other offenses to go at him down the field. 
and uh, is a big reason for Washington's defense as a whole being a huge disappointment. So our dud of the week, one of the biggest duds of the season, Landon Collins, safety for the Washington football team. Now into our team by team breakdown, starting with Da Bears. And Justin Fields is gonna go down. You know, that 73 mark was a, a very respectable rating for a rookie. And even though I was, I would say even just a touch lower on Fields than most people, cause he was kind of the love child of the NFL draft um, pr process really. Uh, I still really liked him and thought that he would be able to really create and elevate an offense while he kind of learned the game. And he's still very clearly learning the game and all of the points that I said as far as processing coverages quickly and getting rid of the ball a little bit quicker. That stuff very clearly has just not been there for Fields. But at the same time, he's also not adding a ton as far as play extension and pushing the ball downfield. There's been little moments where you can see the accuracy that had myself and many people excited about Justin Fields, but just not deploying it as well as he could. So Fields is going to come down. But Justin Herbert, another rookie here, is going to go up. Herbert, a very polished running back coming out of Virginia Tech and plugging right in due to some injuries for the Bears and not really missing a beat in a run game that has been very good. Breaking tackles, showing vision, explosiveness. Looks like the Bears found something in the late rounds with Khalil Herbert. Jason Peters is settling in at left tackle after a bit of a slow start, maybe getting back into football shape at 39 years old. But looking like a piece of his old self. So there's some saving grace, at least for a Bears offensive line that has really struggled. Khalil Mack is gonna come down too. You know, he's still an amazing player and one of the best defensive players in the NFL, but rated up there as a 97 was, you know, one of the best players in the NFL as a whole. And he just seems to be a lesser version of, you know, 2019 Khalil Mack, where he was a weekly game wrecker. He just hasn't been that this season. And even back to last year, he was showing some signs of slowing down on the other side of 30 now. Travis Gibson, however, on the edge has come in as a role player and honestly made some impactful pass rushes in limited opportunities, shown some power off the edge there. So maybe a, a nice role player down the stretch there. Kendall Vilder, athletic young cornerback, getting really flushed into action here for the Bears. He's been fine. You know, he hasn't been this noticeable playmaker at corner or anything like that. But anytime a young corner with this athleticism, which is really off the charts for him, can plug in and you know, not look look, uh, look like a total liability. That's a plus. So excited to see him continue to develop. He was a mid-round, uh, really a late-round pick that I thought was definitely worth a flyer. Good to see him getting on the field. And then DeAndre Houston Carson, he's an interesting player, man. He's been around this team seemingly forever. I mean, he's I think he's been here since like 2016. The Bears have always had good veteran safeties ahead of him, so he's never really gotten these opportunities. But lately, getting pushed in there, and uh, has, has really stepped up and, and filled in nicely. And he's done this in the past. He's one of these kind of uh, feels like he could be a little diamond in the rough. They even had one in Cornelius Lucas at right tackle who just never got the opportunity to start. I would be curious to see what Houston Carson could do in a full-time starting role somewhere after really developing for a long time here for the Bears. Next up, the Cincinnati Bengals. Chris Evans at running back, really a playmaker, catching the ball out of the backfield. It just, it, from the second he stepped on the field at the Senior Bowl, he looked the part of someone that looks like he can be kind of a top five to 10 receiving specialist as a running back. He's an awesome compliment to uh, Joe Mixon. Had a beautiful touchdown on a, 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 a slow go route, fake the slant, got the go, and uh, wheeled in a beautiful like kind of fingertip catch for a touchdown so not just catching the ball out of the backfield screens and short routes and stuff a very legit like receiver running back hybrid type of player that had a falling out with the staff at Michigan but a rookie coming into the NFL in a new situation really really looking like a good player and a good pick for the Bengals as is Jamar Chase the consensus uh, consensus rookie of the year right now he has changed the landscape of this Bengals offense because he's opened up the deep ball <laughs> and his chemistry with Joe Burrow it's it's there and helping this team have explosive plays I mean he speaks for uh, itself in this this raise right here Jamar Chase plus two Quinton Spain is is playing pretty well as a veteran at left guard much needed for the Bengals also Trey Hill a sixth round rookie out of Georgia a young player 21 years old had a terrible combine but was kind of a weird 
weird workout because you watch his tape and he, he does look like an athlete that can get on the move in this wide zone blocking scheme. So he got the start at guard, was a center at Georgia, and had a good, um, a good start. And then Trey Hopkins, minus one, he, on the other hand, doesn't look like he's uh, building off of a, a decent 2020 season. Just kind of a, I don't know if he's been here forever or, or whatever, but he, he falls into that journeyman class of like borderline starter starting centers. Seems to be he's regressing back to the mean a little bit after a big year last year. And then onto the defensive side of the ball, this Bengals front seven has just been so solid. Uh, BJ Hill, what a miserable trade for the Giants and, and what a great offseason for the Bengals, by the way. So BJ Hill, they got him for free, giving away a, a terrible center in Billy Price to get BJ Hill, who's just been week to week to week, a stud up front. And he's even getting after the quarterback a little bit. So that's been an awesome trade for them. DJ Reader getting on the field for them after not playing last year. So massive upticks in their run defense just from that alone. But then you have Trey Hendrickson, this turns out it was actually a great move. And you know, myself and pretty much everybody questioned this, letting Lawson go and bringing in Trey Hendrickson. And, and Hendrickson's actually been a more consistent pass rusher than Lawson ever was, and uh, is healthy, <laughs> um, as, as hard as that is to say. So that was a good move. Uh, we've got Shadobe Awuzie as well. We might as well skip to him because this was another deal this year where they let William Jackson go, saved a little money to bring in Shadobe Awuzie, but it turns out Awuzie is actually playing much better than William Jackson. So this Bengals front office making a, a lot of great moves this offseason. It's, it's been an offseason or a uh, front office that's been a little bit tough to compliment, uh, but man, it's hard to argue with what they've done this offseason. If they can get themselves a couple more offensive linemen, Bengals are, are going to be much more than just a, a playoff contender. Also got a shout out Logan Wilson continues to be a, a dominant linebacker. Honestly, playing like one of the better ones in the league. He had a, a sweet like downfield interception where he he got there a little bit late, but was still in pretty good position in coverage uh, deep up the middle of the field. And he, he just kind of ripped it out of the receiver's hands and ended up hauling uh wheeling it in so i mean he's got what three interceptions this year he's been all over the field he looks awesome i, I really liked him coming out and he's been every bit as good as advertised so a lot of good stuff going for the Bengals. next up the buffalo bills so josh allen a couple more good weeks in a row and it's just kind of like every single week or two weeks that he continues to show that he's accurate and making good decisions and taking better care of the football he's still up there as far as turnover worthy plays but when he's as accurate as he's been over the last 20 plus games and making the plays that he can make you'll take a, a boneheaded play every week as long as it's not four boneheaded plays and that's all pessimistic stuff i mean it's it's really at this point you got to just talk about what josh allen does at such a spectacular level he's the most physically gifted quarterback ever in my opinion his athleticism his escapability his arm talent to literally put the ball wherever he wants whenever he wants it's incredibly difficult to stop josh allen for four quarters even if he might stop himself for a drive uh, but he the crazy thing is he's continuing to um, decrease the amount of those mistakes and then you have emmanuel sanders he's been a pleasant surprise to me i mean i, I really didn't see him being a big like force for this offense with Beasley having the year he had last year with Diggs there and Gabriel Davis and Dawson Knox having a breakout year this year but Emmanuel Sanders has carved his way into this offense and he's been you know kind of their go-to receiver for multiple weeks now so plus one he looks he looks good he looks in shape and healthy and then on to the defensive side of the ball Justin Zimmer been a, a, a solid contributor as a part of a heavy rotation up front there and then Teron Johnson having a, an outstanding season. I want to say he's in a contract season, uh, but a slot corner spot that they're really leaning on him to have a big year, and, and he's stepping up both in run defense and in coverage. And then Tyler Bass, the young kicker here, continuing to just be incredibly stable. He was an awesome pickup for the Bills last season. Now the Denver Broncos, and this is not going to include Thursday night football. Um, just We'll have to see that next week. But Javante Williams continuing to crush it. You know, he, he is an extremely explosive, powerful back. He's splitting the load with Melvin Gordon, who's kind of playing well enough to keep Williams off the field. But Williams, like, per snap, broken tackle rate is the best in the NFL. And for a team that has a, a deep roster, 
good pick to get Javante Williams early second round. Kendall, uh, Kendall Hinton been a fun player to watch. If all these injuries for the Broncos and their receiving core, and Kendall Hinton, if you remember, was the receiver that stepped in and played quarterback for them when they had all three of their quarterbacks uh, put on the inactive list due to COVID last year and played valiantly, but terrible, as you would expect. But clearly a smart kid and a, a really like good worker because he looks quick. He's running good routes. He's making good catches. He's been a like factor for their offense. So plus two for Kendall Hinton. Eric Sobert continues to be a just solid run blocking role player there, blocking his ass off. Now the offensive line for Denver has been really rough. Uh, and I haven't seen the grades from the, the Browns game, but it feels like this is not getting any better. But Graham Glasgow, you know, he hasn't been a Pro Bowl caliber good guard really since he came over from Detroit. He was kind of replacement level last year. He's been a liability for them this year. So that free agent signing looking like maybe a bit of a mistake and a misevaluation. And then Bobby Massey as well. He's still like that kind of replacement level tackle but Chicago at least looks right to have let him go. Charles Leno, we'll talk about him. Maybe not so much there, but Bobby Massey looks a little bit old, a little bit out of shape, hand, uh, struggling with some speed. So minus two, 73 to 71, got just obliterated by Max Crosby. Uh, then Mike Purcell, plus one, just good rotational run defender, veteran dude. Alexander Johnson's been probably the best defender on the Broncos and, and the most fun defender to watch for the Broncos. He is Dante Hightower. I've said this before, but you know they don't put him in compromising situations and coverage. They just have him hover around the line of scrimmage. He's one of the best tacklers in the NFL. He's a 250 plus pound linebacker, instinctive, tough dude, really fun linebacker, a bit of a throwback and uh, a, a limited linebacker, but still a, a really good one in the role that they use him in. And then the secondary, man, this has been up there with one of the biggest disappointing units in the entire NFL. You know, Ronald Darby, they signed him to be a big impact in this cover four quarters defense, and it's not working there. He's really regressing back to the mean on his career that has been a complete roller coaster. So they're getting bad Ronald Darby this year. Kyle Fuller, another Bears player here that does look like they, they may have made the, the right decision to save some money there. I mean, Kyle Fuller's been a, a below average starting corner this year, and it's hard to explain. You know, he's always been a guy that leans on quickness and IQ and has always been good in these off zone quarters style coverages, but it's just not working. I mean, he teams aren't afraid of him at all. They're throwing right underneath him and outside of him, and he's not doing anything. Justin Simmons going down as well, uh, just not showing off the range really, and, and a player that I, I still think will bounce back, but he's actually been like noticeably out of place for that defense. So... You know, this is supposed to be Vic Fangio's specialty is getting these guys kind of on the same page. These are smart veteran players, and it's just not working for Denver. Then we got Cleveland. Uh, again, no Thursday night football here, but Donovan Peoples-Jones week five and six was really stepping up with Jarvis Landry out, making plays down the field. You got Blake Hance, who, you know, you're going to see some of these linemen and fans are going to be like, ah, oh, he's he stinks. Why, are you, why is he going up? Well, you know, guys that are backups are going to get beat by really good players, but he is getting some starting experience and, and hanging in there okay. You're excited to get him off the field, of course, but going to note that he has stepped in and um, sufficed, I suppose. Then on the defensive side of the ball, this Browns defense has been struggling the last few weeks. Uh, again, no Thursday night football there, but Andrew Billings coming off the opt-out last year looks just useless when he's been out there and he's not even really a part of this rotation so just a, a, a more of a note on Andrew Billings just really nowhere to be found uh, thought he was going to be a nice signing a year ago and, and yeah man he's just nowhere to be found Jeremiah Awusu Koromoa I think I finally can say that name without stuttering or looking it back up I, I, hopefully I got that right but uh yeah, man, he, he's been a stud. He, he has been injured, or he, he is injured now, but when he's been out there, he has just flown around. He's one of these kind of aggressive gambling style linebackers, uh, but he's been really good at guessing right, and then when he arrives, he arrives. So just an all-around impact, even been a better run defender than you may be expected. Then Ronnie Harrison is struggling after uh, kind of a breakout season last year, just new scheme, not very comfortable. Uh, kind of running those quarters cover coverages 
and getting less time to kind of play around the line of scrimmage like he did last year. So perhaps just a, a scheme that doesn't fit him as well. Hey everyone, I just wanna take a second to interrupt the video and remind you that if you enjoy the Madden aspect of everything that I do, to check out my second YouTube channel that is TFG Plays, that link is in the description below. Check it out where I am doing my realistic Bengals rebuild. Also, you can follow week by week condensed games of my online 32 man league as we are looking to restore the Niners to glory with Trey Lance. So if you enjoy the Madden side of things, all of my Madden content has moved to TFG Plays. And I encourage you to go follow over there and I'll see you there. Back to the video. Then the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Leonard Fournette, grounding it and pounding it, looking really good, in shape, looking more like playoff Lenny than regular season Lenny. Antonio Brown, ugh, this just, if you're not a Bucs fan, this just makes your skin just crawl because the fact that he's on this team, he's 33 years old, and he's playing like prime 27-year-old Antonio Brown for a $2 million contract on this receiving core, it's, it's insane, but man, he has overshadowed um, Mike Evans and Chris Godwin and become the focal point of this passing game. He is uncoverable right now. He might be the best receiver in the NFL right now, not named Devontae Adams. So he is crushing it, going up four because we know what he's capable when he looks athletic and looks in shape and stays out of trouble. And that's what he's been for the Bucks. Donovan Smith also having the best year of his career. It was a question mark on if they were gonna be able to retain him and they kind of gambled on him and, and brought him back. And, and man, he has really held down that left side of the line. And then on the defensive side of the ball, Shaq Barrett, just as I question if maybe he's regressing a little bit. Nope, he just had a couple down weeks and turned around and had maybe the best two-week stretch of his career. I mean, he, he's been outstanding for the Bucks defense the last couple of weeks. Jamel Dean has gotten back out there. His ascension continues. You know, he's uber athletic, big bodied corner and a beautiful interception. I was at the Eagles game the week before. It was the Eagles game. And uh, yeah, he, he's a super talented player. And I think, you know, Davis does his thing, but I think Jamel Dean has a chance to be their, their best corner. And Ross Cockrell is a very good um, veteran defender. He, he actually was a factor for this team last year as their fourth corner, but they've had to step, uh, ask him to step up with all these injuries. And he's just a like smart veteran. He at a point in time, he was super athletic. He's a older version of himself now, but he still is a good athlete at his age. So he's just a good corner, like a starting caliber, quality depth veteran guy that's stepping up really well. Then the Arizona Cardinals, Kyler Murray, almost the star of the week until Derrick Henry said, "Nope, it's gonna be me this week." But uh, Kyler Murray to me is the MVP of the season so far. And he is, he is shooting up. And the thing with Kyler Murray is not, of course, the play extension, the amazing stuff that he does, throwing the ball downfield, his accuracy. Like, we've known all that stuff about Kyler Murray, but now he's doing those things at an even higher clip. But what's most reassuring about Kyler Murray is the stuff he's doing in structure and in particular attacking the intermediate part of the field where he's really struggled. I mean, he has truly... Uh, emphasized his strengths with the big play stuff and worked on his weaknesses as far as attacking the middle of the field and playing in structure. So he's just been, to me, the best quarterback in the NFL through six weeks and continues to climb. And the sky is the limit for Kyler Murray. I don't think people realize how good his arm and accuracy truly are. James Conner's been a good power back, rotational piece for him. Looks in shape, playing, playing good football for the Cardinals as that kind of closer tight for them. Christian Kirk, Rondale Moore, both these guys just kind of moving in and out of the slot, doing fun stuff with the ball in their hands, getting the ball downfield. The catch that Rondale Moore had in week five against the Niners was so good to see because we know Rondale Moore is going to be a gimmick superstar, right? Jet sweeps, bubble screens, put him in at running back, all that stuff. There was, there was no doubt that him coming out of Purdue, he was gonna be good at that. The question was, what happens when you ask him to go downfield and make tough catches along the sideline and in traffic? Well, they, they asked him to do it, or at least Kyler did, on the sideline, and he has a toe drag, body control catch at, at five foot seven, no problem. So Rondale Moore, the sky's, I don't wanna say the sky's the limit for him, cause you know, he's not gonna be as good as DeAndre Hopkins ever, probably at five foot seven, but man, he, he is super talented and, probably should have been a first round pick for somebody. 
Then we have the offensive line, Justin Pugh going up plus two and Max Garcia. This is kind of funny. I, I was looking at these guys' uh, PFF profiles and, <laughs> you know, I was like, uh, obviously Justin Pugh was a Pro Bowl caliber guy for the Giants back in the day. That's why the Cardinals gave him all that money. And he's really been just decent, like, a, a, uh, average veteran for them since they signed him. But you go back to 2014, like he was a he was one of the best guards in football. And then I was like, wait, Max Garcia wasn't he a quality starter for for the Broncos like a long time ago? And sure enough, 2014 I think was the year he had a really good season and, and was a good player for them. Just has completely disappeared. Well, Garcia's been starting at guard. He started at center this week uh, against the Browns. And has just been playing outstanding football. And both these guys, it's like they went into the time machine and brought out their 2014-year-old self. And it doesn't stop there. You've got J.J. Watt, who's winding back the clock himself a little bit, just staying healthy and, and playing good football. And Robert Altford, who people completely forgot about because he hasn't played football in about two years. Well, he's been their best corner. And, um, well, that's not necessarily true. But he's he's been a a surprisingly good corner people didn't even know if he was going to be able to stay healthy and play for them so all these you know you have these young players kyler murray kirk rondale moore stepping up and playing great football but it's it's kind of funny how we think of this cardinals team as this young kind of exciting team when in reality a, a big part of their success has been guys like justin Pugh, max garcia jj watt robert alford winding back the clock even aj green is heating up a little bit lately so everything's working for the cardinals and man, it's they're they're such a fun team. They're so fun. Talking about fun teams, we've got the Chargers up next. So Keenan Allen, I think it's time we drop him. I I really do. He's he's not separating at the same level. He's dropping the football. He he just hasn't been that superstar receiver. He's still a very good player, uh, and I hope he can kind of bounce back and get back to that elite level. But perhaps just slowing down. He's guys had a ton of injuries. He's he's I think 30 years old at this point, and he's never been an elite athlete. So it's you never like to see this but i think it is time donald parham on the other hand young ascending tight end just limited looks because of jared cook's uh, presence on this team but parham uh kind of a fan favorite xfl superstar just making plays left and right blocking better and yeah i, I like donald parham a lot i think he's the long-term tight end for them michael schofield has stepped in at right guard and played really good football he, he apparently can only like block when he's on the Chargers because other teams have tried him and he's been terrible. But for the Chargers, he's been now in two stints, a very good pass protecting right guard. So surviving that Ode Abushi injury, it was going to be a difficult thing for them, but it seems getting Michael Schofield in there is going to be an answer. Uh, going to an, an old trick there. And then Christian Covington just has been a complete and utter disaster on the inside. He's getting significant reps for the Chargers. And he's a big part of why the Ravens ran all over him. The Browns ran all over him. He's he's just not holding the line and, and teams are going right at him. So minus two for, for Christian Covington. Nasir Adderley is going to go up one. He was a guy that was on my breakout players list for the 2021 season. And he's settling in. You know, he's, he's in this new scheme. So maybe took a little bit of time. But yeah, he's been flying around. Been a really good just all around balanced safety next to Derwin James there and, and he's got a good ceiling it was a high second round pick a guy a lot of people thought could have been a first rounder so he's playing his best football and hopefully just getting started there for Nasir Adderley then the Kansas City Chiefs a polarizing season to say the least so uh, some good some bad here you know minus the turnovers the Chiefs offense is playing really good football me Cole Hardman is finding his own role in a weird way you know I still wish he was a better route runner and better bringing in the ball but he's, he's been a, a force for them you got Jody Fortson, kind of that just third tight end that comes in in certain packages, but Mahomes likes to go to him, man. He's had some big plays, some touchdowns, and a nice uh, nice catch down the sidelines. So converted receiver, tight end, hybrid type. They seem to have found some bit of a mismatch piece with him. And then these rookie offensive linemen, man. For all the bad stuff going on for the Chiefs, the fact that they found two of the biggest steals in the entire draft – I mean, that's eventually going to come back the other way and be a big deal for this team because Trey Smith and Creed Humphrey never should have been available to them when they got him. But Creed Humphrey in the second round, late in the second round, uh, has been the best center in the NFL per PFF, at least the highest graded one. His run blocking has been just unbelievable. I mean, he's just paving ways for these running backs. Unfortunately, 
that running back is Daryl Williams, who doesn't have a lot of explosiveness. But yeah, he's he's been awesome. He's been solid in pass protection too. And then Trey Smith, same same kind of deal. I mean, these are very run block oriented guys, and I, I think you can you can point and say like, okay, from a pass protection standpoint, these guys do still have a ways to go. Uh, but when they're run blocking like this at you know some of the highest clips in the league, you almost take that. <laughs> Um, but Trey Smith going up two this week, you know, the heart condition, team stayed away from him. I, I've said it before, I'll say it again. I He was right there with Elijah Vera Tucker for me as far as his tape grade. He, he is a truly special athlete at the guard position. I think he could even step out and play tackle if they needed him to. But yeah, just huge finds there on the offensive line. Now let's talk about this defense that's been, you know, really the worst in the NFL to me, when I look at what's wrong with this defense, it's it's the front four has been a disaster, and the linebackers. So you have Derek Nadi, who has been a solid nose tackle for them, is, is just not holding his his end of the bargain there. Tershawn Wharton has been a problem in run defense. Even though he's a pass rushing specialist, he is out there for run defense snaps, and he's very undersized, he's like 270 pounds. So that's been a problem for them. Colin Sanders, has had no development. In fact, he's getting worse. And Jerron Reed was was kind of supposed to be an answer for this team on the inside. I think getting him was a big reason they moved Chris Jones outside because they felt so good about this interior group. But he was almost my dud of the week. I mean, Jerron Reed has been straight up one of the worst players in the entire NFL. He is just getting blown off the ball. And he's offering nothing in, as a pass rusher either. He is, to me, and, and he's getting a ton of snaps, by the way. Like, they still think he's good, and he's been just terrible for this team. So I really think he needs to be benched. I think this team needs to make a move for an interior piece or just, heck, move Chris Jones back inside. But, yeah, it's uh, it's been a nightmare for this defensive line. Anthony Hitchens as well. You know he can't cover. He never has. But when he's out there missing tackles and not making plays in run defense and letting guys get through the second level, it's, it's time for him to get benched as well. And then in the secondary... Uh, it hasn't been great either. Uh, Rashad Fenton, on the other hand, continues to just surprise. I mean, he was an undrafted pickup, I think, or a sixth-round pick out of South Carolina. But ever since he's been getting starting reps, he's just been incredibly solid. I will say Legereus Sneed has definitely regressed after a breakout rookie season. He's just, he's been getting beat this year, and he hasn't really made any plays and looks like maybe a little bit of a pump the brakes. I still like Legereus Sneed, but he has been struggling as this team's kind of leaned on him to be their best corner, whereas last year he was kind of this uh, slot mismatch piece. It, it just hasn't been there at the same level for Legereus Sneed. And then we can get Daniel Sorensen out of the way where he's been, you know, a, a total scapegoat for this team, uh, for fans to attack, I mean, and, and rightfully so. I mean, he's been just maybe the worst cover player in the NFL this season. He finally got benched, so that's good for the Chiefs defense. I will say Mike Hughes has been a very nice pickup for them. I think Minnesota moved off of him too quickly. I know there was some off the field stuff going on there, uh, or at least injury stuff, but to me, I think that was kind of a dumb move by Zimmer. Former first round pick. Yeah, he's not an uber athlete, but he's got instincts. He's got some quickness. And the Chiefs snatch him right up, and he looks like a starting caliber player. So kind of a weird deal, kind of weird that the Chiefs were able to get him, but it's been a good move for the Chiefs. Then the Colts starting to play some good football, so Carson Wentz, I honestly don't think getting enough credit. I mean, he's been attacking the middle of the field at a high level, something that has always been a big criticism of him. He's taken care of the football, he's fixed his footwork, he's been accurate throwing the ball downfield. There's no reason Carson Wentz can't get back up into the you know, top 15, dare I say top 10 quarterback conversation. He hasn't been quite as athletic, I will say that. And I haven't noticed his arm, you know, seeing him really rip it and showing off like elite arm strength. So perhaps the injury is adding up a little bit there, but Carson Wentz is, is playing his best football since his MVP season that I call an MVP season. Then Jonathan Taylor, plus one, 84 to an 85, speaks for itself. You watch any Colts game the last two weeks, he's been their offense. He's been outstanding. Uh, certainly in the mix for the top 10 running back conversation. There's a lot of great running backs, but you know, he's kind of a baby Derrick Henry who can catch the ball is kind of my comp for Jonathan Taylor. Michael Pittman, just super reliable. He still isn't like separating a ton, but every time they throw him the football, he comes down with it. He's got some of the best pair of hands in the NFL. 
and he's uh, kind of helped the the receiving core be stabilized with all the uh, mi- moving parts and injuries they've had there. Getting some low-level contributors on the offensive line as well. Matt Pryor's interesting. Uh, he's playing really good football at right tackle, stepping up for Braden Smith. That's been good for them. And Chris Reed, a veteran, stepping in for Quentin Nelson at left guard, run blocking at a very high level. So eh, stabilizing the offensive line a little bit until they can get those guys back. Matt Pryor has some upside to maybe be a long-term piece there. Probably more of just a swing man, but definitely interesting. Then on the defensive side of the ball, Taylor Stallworth contributing to what's been one of the best run defenses in the NFL as a rotational piece, as has Tyquan Lewis. Finally reaching his potential as that bigger bodied edge piece, getting after the quarterback a little bit. Quiddy Pay as well has been an unbelievable run defender. Almost non-existent as a pass rusher so far, but at least he's bringing something to the table out there as he hopefully continues to become a better pass rusher in time. But yeah, they've, they've been a really tough team to run against, and they've another good test this week against the Niners. As for the secondary, this has been a problem. You know, Kenny Moore got the big contract as a, as a slot corner, and, and he has had his worst season, really. I mean, teams are going right at him in the slot. It's, it's a tough spot. You can get picked on, but it, you, you never want to see a guy getting beat as much as he has been this year. Xavier Rhodes as well. He had a good year for this team last year, but hasn't been the same this year. Uh, giving up a lot more completions. And then Isaiah Rogers kind of making things interesting, honestly. I mean, he was a total project coming out of Massachusetts, but a guy with very legit, like, I would say high 4-2 speed or low 4-2 speed or whatever. You saw it on that return should have been touchdown against the Ravens, where they ruled that the lateral went forward. But you pair what is genuine elite speed and a guy that's covering at a decent level in a rotational role He's obviously not going to take Kenny Moore's job anytime soon, but it's just kind of a reminder that slot corner is a very easy spot to find, and sometimes guys with this kind of athleticism, you just want to gamble on late late in drafts because, man, it just it translates at this position. So he's been fun to see in, in limited reps and will be a fun player to continue to monitor. Okay, big deep breath here for the Dallas Cowboys. What is this, 18 players on the move? So here we go. Dak Prescott, I will give him uh, some love here finally. It's It's been few and far between for Dak on this channel, but man, he is just like the, he's the catalyst for this offense. His decision-making, how, how well he's able to, you know, he gets the ball out, he puts it in the right place. Very, very Tom Brady-esque where, you know, he's not always creating a ton, um, but man, is he fully utilizing this unbelievable situation around him to the best of his ability and, and better than most quarterbacks would. So his accuracy, his decision-making, his processing at an elite level. And then he's doing some stuff to create plays as well. So that's adding on top of all this stuff. So he, he's playing at a very, very high level. Um, then we got the running backs. Both Zeke and Pollard have been super electric. Uh, Got to be the best one-two punch in the NFL right now. These receivers, outstanding. C.D. Lamb, what a what a steal he was last year in the first round. I mean, he is he is just an elite talent at the receiver position. He's even faster than I thought he was. He's been coming down with those contested catches. His leaping ability is outstanding. So quick with the ball in his hands. I mean, he's he's become their focal point. Like he has made uh, Amari Cooper a bit of an afterthought. Which after week one, I was kind of laughing at, at the thought of that happening because I love Amari Cooper, but. Just what C.D. Lamb does, I think, is so much more complimentary to the way Dak likes to play football. So uh, he's been awesome. Cedric Wilson is like a poor man C.D. Lamb. He's super fast, super quick. He's come down with some tough catches. So he's been getting the ball a ton with with Michael Gallup out. And then Noah Brown has actually made some plays as well in in what limited opportunities he gets here. But he's an interesting player, a big-bodied guy coming out of Ohio State that was just kind of forgotten about. But his always made plays when they've called on him. He's a great run blocker as well. So just an embarrassment of riches. Dalton Schultz as well. He's been like one of the better tight ends in the NFL this year. I got so much crap from Cowboys fans when I said, look, Dalton Schultz, he has a chance to be like Jason Witten-esque. And that's exactly what he's been for them this year. He's a chain mover. He's been a great blocker. I I think that's quietly one of my better takes is that Dalton Schultz was going to be able to fill that void long term for, for Jason Witten. Uh, he's totally done that. And then for the offensive line, I mean, so much respect to go around here as well. 
this is part of why I am a little bit slower to give Dak all the praise because, I mean, he's got the best running back duo. He's got this unbelievable receiving core. Um, and then he has the best offensive line in the NFL right now. Tyron Smith, who unfortunately did just have a neck issue pop back up. We're awaiting word to see kind of the, the how serious that is, but he's been in shape and looks like his old self, which we know is one of the best tackles of all time. Uh, and he's playing like that right now. He's been the best offensive lineman in the NFL this year, not named Zach Martin, <laughs> who's going to go up to a 97 this week. I mean, he's just obliterating people up front. Like the next time you watch the Cowboys, just watch Zach Martin. It's it's unfair what he does to people. He is the best guard in football. I'm, I'm sorry, Colts fans, um, but he's he's officially past Quentin Nelson for me. Then we have Terrence Steele, who's stepping up at right tackle, an athletic guy coming out of Texas Tech, and he's been a great run blocker, getting some help from Zach Martin next to him for sure, but uh, paving the way in the run game and holding his own as a pass protector. So you have both him and Connor McGovern, who's played like fullback and guard and just like they have six, seven deep of really good offensive linemen here. Connor Williams has reached his potential at left guard. We've talked about him over the last few weeks. And all of this, I think, is helping Tyler Biadash settle in. I liked Biadash coming out of Wisconsin. He's really struggled in pass protection, uh, but he's stabilized the last couple weeks. And I think that's going to continue. Uh, he's a talented player, uh, smart, tough dude that with all this talent around him, uh, you just assume he's going to continue to develop. So, whew, holy crap, this this Cowboys offense, everything is working right now uh, at, at such a high level. And then for the defense, I, I would say some good, some bad. So Brent Urban, it's the scheme change really for me. He was a good run defender as that kind of four eye piece for the Bears in a three four defense and just not getting utilized the same. He's a weird like six, seven, 300 pound build where you put him in a true defensive tackle position. He's just, people are gonna get under him. He doesn't have the raw strength to play that. So he has been a, a tough spot for them as a run defender, but these edge guys stepping up, Terrell Bosham, uh, Randy Gregory, we've talked about what Micah Parsons brings to the table out there and, and they're getting Demarcus Lawrence back. Uh, so Bosham's just been, you know, being a good run defender, showing some power as a rusher. Randy Gregory's having his best season. I mean, he's like bull rushing people. And there's that clip of him doing that against Riley Reef. I think it was last year. Uh, but he's always been kind of viewed as this speed rusher type. But the fact that he's added this power element with those long arms, and you know he's got get off and bend and some pass rush moves. I mean, with, with weed legal now, there's no reason Randy Gregory can't be like a top 10 pass rusher in the NFL late in his career. So that's terrifying with the fact of um, Lawrence coming back. I will say Leighton Vander Esch really, really struggling. I think it's it's the injuries have, have slowed him down. I mean, he just is not an explosive player. He's getting beat in coverage. He's missing tackles. He has fallen off so, so quickly after looking like he was gonna have a really bright future. I think he's gone at this point from Dallas, uh, contract year. And then J. Ron Curse has been a nice pickup at safety. You know, he's not a great cover player. He's kind of that bandit, big, you know, safety type. Uh, but his tackling and his pursuit is up there with the best of them. I mean, he he's six foot four. He's got long arms. When he gets his hands on you, you're not going anywhere. And he can hit you too. So uh, he brings an aspect of, of consistency in the tackling game uh, to that part of the field. And they don't lean on him too much in coverage. So we did it. We got through the Cowboys. Let's move on to the Miami Dolphins. Albert Wilson is going to come down, just not passing the eye test after not playing last season. Just, you know, struggling to wheel the ball in, struggling to get open. Just seems like kind of an afterthought here for the Dolphins. Then Liam Eichenberg has been at least starting at left tackle, and I'm glad that they've put him at tackle, but they seem to have seen something to say that maybe he shouldn't be starting a tackle because he has been really, really bad. Uh, just kind of getting beat by everyone this year, both speed and power. So I liked him coming out. I didn't think he was a true first round player, but I didn't think he'd be this bad. So he's coming down for the third week in a row. Greg Mance, on the other hand, has stepped in at center where they've desperately needed someone. And He's been at least one stable force there. We'll see how sustainable that is. It's Greg Mance, but he's played well. Then on the defensive side of the ball, some good things going on here with some young young players. Christian Wilkins 
having probably his best season. He's been getting after the quarterback really well. He's having his best year as a run defender. So that's nice. And then Javon Holland, early second round pick for them, was my number one safety in this class and starting to play a little bit more like it, showing that range, the tackling ability, just a true do-it-all safety. And I think he does have a very bright future here for the Dolphins. Now the Philadelphia Eagles, Jalen Hurts is going to come down. I mean, we've talked about him on the podcast and the power rankings, just the accuracy, the the hero ball style. It's just, it's not working. Um, I think they got to go to Minshew at some point here, but they probably won't because they're kind of stubborn here. It hurts at this point. So he can lead some crazy comebacks and make some plays, but it's just not, it, there's no element of consistency with Jalen Hurts at all. Then you have Andre Dillard, you know, playing very serviceable left tackle here, former first round pick, really good pass protection technique. He's added some weight, which I think has helped him handle power a little bit more. And he's staying healthy. So I think they still believe in Andre Dillard, uh, even though they've paid Jordan Maialata, they have Lane Johnson there. But to know that he is an asset to this team is a big deal. Jordan Maialata, the Eagles continue to look right for paying him early because he's just getting better every single week. He actually stepped out and played right tackle this this last week or two. He's actually been stepping out and playing right tackle, so he can now play from both sides. One of the best run-blocking linemen in the league and uh, just perpetually developing as a pass protector. Uh, so some young depth at tackle. I do wonder if Lane Johnson might be a, a trade bait piece for the Eagles. Then you got Jack Driscoll. Uh, one of my favorite diamond in the rough linemen from last year is actually playing really good at guard and it's it's in the same ways that he played good at tackle at in in college at auburn as a pass protector above run blocking a very light player coming out and i, I was curious how he would play at guard and he's holding up you know i don't know if he's added weight or what or if he just isn't going against power rushers yet uh, but he has outstanding discipline as a pass protector and it's it's been good for them so this Eagles offensive line is a lot of youth and depth. Then Quez Watkins really stepping up as that deep threat, big play maker for them. Uh, it's been fun to see him develop. And then on the defensive side of the ball, Alex Singleton, just he, he ain't it, man. He, he can't run sideline side to sideline. And the, the missed tackles are becoming a serious problem for this Eagles defense from Alex Singleton. Davion Taylor has been benefiting from these linebackers not playing well. He's a mid-round pick out of Colorado, more safety than linebacker, but he's put on some weight, uh, getting some, you know, 15, 20 snaps a week and, uh, you know, hanging in coverage a little bit. So hopefully getting into more of a serious role as we move forward from him. Avante Maddox has been maybe the most pleasant surprise for the Eagles this season. I mean, he's right back to being one of the best slot corners in the NFL. His speed is outstanding, really, and uh, his quickness is at the top of the league. So just for him to kind of get in a scheme where he's comfortable, where he's not making stupid mistakes, he is he has solidified himself, I think, as, as one of the premium slot corners in the league. I've always liked Devontae Maddox, but he's had some struggles over the last couple of years. Then you got Marcus Epps has filled in as a decent kind of balanced safety. Just a role player there, but he's been nice. Now one of the Atlanta Falcons coming off the bye week from week six, coming home from London, but uh, Corderell Patterson, going off again against the Jets, playing a little more receiver week five than running back, but still doing a little bit of both. But that's kind of the more of the surprise is, is him getting open over the middle of the field and making plays as a receiver, which they've never been able to really get him going throughout his career. Other teams haven't, uh, but the Falcons have found a way to use him. Tajay Sharp stepping up. He was once a notable starting caliber receiver for the Titans that just completely disappeared. Not a great athlete, but a tough receiver. Has kind of found a new home here and he's playing okay. Kyle Pitts, so fun to see him get going. We actually lowered him to overall in, in our last studs and duds before the Jets game. So he is going to get those two back, basically showing what we knew he was capable of coming out of Florida is that uber tight end receiver hybrid playmaker. Then we have Adeta Kumbo Agundeje, who's a rookie out of Notre Dame. Now this is gonna be you know, a little bit back and forth here because you'll see going from 62 to a 64. I was incredibly low on uh, Agundeje. So on, on one hand, it's good to see him getting starting reps and not getting lost or being a complete liability, but also like he's made virtually no plays. He's just kind of like hanging around. 
um, dead flat, like 60 PFF grade. So I, I will give him credit for, you know, coming in, not getting blown off the ball, a couple different pass rushes, gets a sack against the Jets. So good on him for mixing into the rotation, but I really was unimpressed by his tape at Notre Dame because I didn't think he did anything particularly well, and that's kind of held up for the Falcons, but good on him for getting on the field for the worst defensive line in the NFL. Uh, then in the secondary, A.J. Terrell just continues to be a, just a good pick for them. Like He's just a super solid corner, lengthy guy, has good long speed, finds the ball. I really like A.J. Terrell. I think he's ascending. And then Jalen Hawkins has a beautiful pick against Zach Wilson uh, in a cover two where he really broke on the ball, read Zach Wilson's eyes. And I don't know if he's a player for them or not, but certainly worthy of a boost for a good game against the Jets. Now the Washington football team, it's just weird that this team is like an offensive team, um, but we'll talk about why here, uh, why the offense has been good and the defense has been so bad. DeAndre Carter has stepped in, really good athlete. Uh, Washington's been this kind of redemption hub for players like Carter, for guys like Ricky Seals-Jones, who is basically having the Logan Thomas season from last year where he's getting a ton of targets and doing decent with them, but nothing like overwhelmingly impressive. Um, but both of these guys contributing, moving the ball for the offense. And then the offensive line, my goodness, this has quietly been one of the better O-lines in the whole league. So Sam Cosme played about half of that Saints game and was continuing to just obliterate dudes in the run game. So seeing it another week for a half, even then I'm like, all right, this, this guy's legit. But Cornelius Lucas has stepped in for the last six quarters because Cosme did get hurt. And Cornelius Lucas continues to show that he was just always an oversight by the Chicago Bears. He was a backup for them for like six years, it felt like. Finally gets brought in here, gets significant playing time, and he's been a rock for them. So they have answers at right tackle. Charles Leno, who they brought in from the Bears, is actually having his best season certainly in the last two years, but maybe of his career, he's still on the younger side. Like he's not, you know, 35 years old or anything. He still has a lot of football left in him. So they got tackles, they got guards. Uh, they have Wes Schwetzer, who they brought in last year, who had a good year. He's getting some opportunities at right guard with Brandon Sheriff out, and he's playing really good football. Eric Flowers, they traded peanuts to the Dolphins for him and they stole the Dolphins' only good offensive lineman, and he's been one of the better pass-protecting guards in the NFL this year. Uh, Rolier's still been really good at center. So this offensive line is really deep and talented, honestly. Uh, they don't get enough credit for what they've done with this old line. Now on the defensive side of the ball, uh, Jonathan Allen is, has been having a field day this, uh, this whole season. He's going off. He continues to refine his pass rush package and get better as a run defender. Just a super good, talented uh, not just good, like he's one of the best interior defensive linemen in the NFL. Uh, he's the one piece up front here that's kind of met their expectations for this year. It's just unfortunate that the rest of the guys haven't stepped in uh, and done the same. But KC Tuhill is playing well in a rotation, really athletic, kind of hybrid defender coming out of Stanford. Uh, and he's, he's you know, settling in as a role player into that Ryan Kerrigan role here. And then for this secondary, this has been a disaster. I mean, this was supposed to be a really good secondary, and they have been maybe the worst in the NFL. So Kendall Fuller has been getting just torched. William Jackson has been totally getting torched. And we talked about Landon Collins as the dud. So Ron Rivera has got to get this secondary in place. He's got a tough, tough test this week against Green Bay. But that's really where I look at for this defense and why they've been so bad is, you know, Fuller hasn't been the same. William Jackson has been a terrible free agent signing, and Landon Collins is completely out of place in this scheme. Uh, so there you go. There's your Washington football team. And then the Niners, easy one to do here. Uh, the bye week six and only one player getting movement from the week five game against Arizona. And that's Javon Kinlaw. Oh, man, I, I still think he can turn this thing around, but it's looking very, very Jerry Tillery-esque where he just doesn't have the play strength to hold up and run defense. And we aren't seeing that remarkable power that he had in college show up uh, in the NFL level. I mean, he has a remarkably low uh, pass rush win rate right now. Ugh, man, it just does not look good for Javon Kinlaw, who was a bit of a one-year wonder with kind of some 
you know, not like off-field red flags or anything, but just player care, uh, player um, profile red flags. Like he was a 23-year-old breakout player who kind of had this weird senior bowl moment where he like had a couple wins and then he left because he was like, that's all I need to show. So he really didn't show a ton in college, enough to get into the first round because it was what he showed was amazing. But man, was that just a flash in the pan? And is Javon Kinlaw just a bust? I, I don't know. I, I'm surprised to say that, but gosh, he's been a liability for the Niners up front. All right, the New York Giants been a rough stretch for them, but not for Kadarius Tony, who looks frankly elite with the ball in his hands. Just so good at making guys miss, but the route running, the hands have been really good. So Kadarius Tony looks like a find in the first round, uh, but it has not been enough to shelter this offensive line where Nate Solder just ain't it anymore. Simply put, Matt Skura looked like maybe a decent pickup, but it was weird. You know, he had a decent year for the Ravens and then the um, Dolphins picked him up in free agency, but then he didn't even make the Miami Dolphins, who might be the only offensive line here worse than the Giants. Ends up starting at left guard, and oh my god, it's it's terrible. So he's had some good football in his career, but something is wrong with Matt Skura right now. Then on the defensive side of the ball, the Danny Shelton pickup hasn't worked. Reggie Ragland's been a nice pickup, though. He's, he's come in and played linebacker for them with Martinez out, and I won't say they haven't missed a beat, but he's been very solid as a tackler and kind of getting everyone in the right place on that defense. Tay Crowder, on the other hand, I don't really understand why he's still playing. It's not like I have him rated particularly high, but yeah, man, the missed tackles, the um, just, he's he's super skinny. He gets blown off the ball. He's out of place in coverage. He just, he's not a, he's not an NFL like player. Like he, he just looks really bad out there. So he's going down. Uh, Jabril Peppers also, it's, it's not been a good week for strong safeties, uh, but Peppers, is, his coverage has been really poor this year. His, his tackling and run defense hasn't been there either. So uh, just a rough stretch for the Giants and no, you know, no light in sight, I suppose. Then the Jags, James Robinson has seriously been one of the best running backs in the NFL. The undrafted free agent from last year, uh, just, you know, bruising faster than you'd expect do it all three down back ah, it's just unfortunate that uh, Travis Etienne is going to come back and, and muddy this thing up because there's no reason James Robinson shouldn't be you know in that feature back conversation he's you know he really reminds me of is Josh Jacobs uh, so he's been outstanding Jamal Agnew plus two he's been a pleasant surprise I I did not think this was going to work with him converting from you know he, he did this for Detroit last year and honestly wasn't all that impressive as a receiver, but he was a corner when he came into the NFL, a great kick returner, but he's actually like really worked on his craft as a slot receiver. You know, he's got speed, but he's getting open. He's, he's coming down to some tough catches. So he's been a very pleasant surprise for the Jags, as has this pass rush the last uh, few weeks. So Dwayne Smoot went up last week and is going to go up again this week. He's a really good player, man. He's a bargain for the Jags right now. He's always been good when he gets his opportunities, but a mid-round pick, not the best of athletes, has never really gotten that full opportunity. Well, he's keeping Caleb, uh, Caleb on chase on off the field. He delivered his own baby uh, in his house this week. Um, just uh, seems like a really cool dude uh, hearing about that story. I'm a big fan of Dwayne Smoot and kind of a uh, under the radar stud for the Jags. Josh Allen had his best week since his, at least since his rookie year, uh, went off against the Dolphins. Granted, it's the Dolphins offensive line, but uh, good to see that in there for Josh Allen. Uh, hopefully he can get that thing rolling again because he had a down year last year after looking like a potential superstar as a rookie. Caleb on Chason even getting involved again just against the Dolphins, but for Caleb on Chason, that's a big deal. I think he has sacks and back-to-back -back weeks. I could be wrong about that, but uh, yeah, first round pick last year was always going to take some time. So good to see him getting some pass rush wins and building off of something. And then for the defense, these safeties are playing really good football. Uh, Rayshon Jenkins was a big free agent signing for them. He's getting more comfortable in this scheme. And then Andrew Wingard has held off uh, the fan favorite Andre Sisco down there. Well, you know, Wingard, feels like every week he's making a play on the ball he's coming down making a tough tackle he's a he's a good player and I, I think he's maybe a starting caliber guy long term I, I don't know I, I just I enjoy watching Andrew Wingard 
And then the kicker situation here, Josh Lambeau getting cut. I feel like he's probably going to bounce back somewhere. He's been such a good kicker for a long time. He's got the yips right now. Uh, but Matthew Wright, fun character, coming in, winning the game for the Jags, gets created for me at a 71. Then the Jets get Elijah Vera Tucker settling in, mauling dudes in the run game up front there next to George Fant, who's kind of doing the same. It's a really athletic, strong um, duo there. Obviously, Becton's going to come back, but Fant's been a very pleasant surprise for the Jets. And I think, you know, long term, they're, they're paying him a decent contract. I think he can either play right guard or right tackle, but he's playing as a quality starter for them this year. And I think these two guys are going to continue to grow. So if you're looking for some optimism for the Jets, it's you get Becton back. These two guys are playing pretty well. McGovern had his best game against the Jags. If that O-line shapes into place, it's going to make it way easier for them to build up Zach Wilson. And then on the defensive side of the ball, this defense is playing really good football. Uh, getting familiar with this Robert Salah scheme now. So you got uh, John Franklin Myers, gets the big contract extension, makes him look good, uh, blowing up the, the Jags old line a little bit. And he's been just sound every single week. You know, it's funny, when, when they paid him, uh, a lot of people were like, who's John Franklin Myers? Well, if you've been watching this series, you, you know who John Franklin Myers is. This has been one of the highest risers over the last, I don't know, 10, 15 episodes of this thing. Tim Ward also... Just a couple really good uh, pass deflections, uh, putting on some pressure off the edge there, just kind of a rotational piece, but they're super deep up front. Now, with these linebackers, C.J. Mosley, man, uh, yikes. It's It's been noticeable that he just he isn't very fast. He tried to lose some weight to speed up, and it just hasn't been a good combination there. He's been out of place and covered. He's been missing more tackles than he ever has. Almost the dud of the week. I do wonder if C.J. Mosley's going to get moved here before the deadline. Because I just don't think he's a part of the, the long-term future here, and he's very expensive. Especially when these young linebackers look pretty good. You know, Quincy Williams was a third-round pick for the Jags several years ago, and just never worked out there. But getting better coaching here with the Jets, he's settling in and looks fast. Jamie and Sherwood, a, a rookie out of Auburn who played safety, uh, but was one of the best tacklers in college football, now converting to linebacker. You know, he's not a fast player, ran like a 4-8. That's why they moved him to linebacker. But, you know, you can survive as a slower linebacker uh, if you're tough and tackle the way he has. So he he looks like a, a find. He's a tough dude, and he wants it. He wants to be a good NFL player, which that'll get you somewhere. Then these young corners, Bryce Hall continues to just play incredibly sound. What a find he was. An injury risk coming out that fell to, like, the sixth round. They pick him up. He's got length. He's a good zone corner for this system. He had another two pass deflections. You know, he looks like he's going to be a quality starter for this team for a while. Brandon Ecole's, I'm not going to say quality starter yet. He's super fast, was incredibly raw coming out of Kentucky. Yeah, you know, he can turn around and, and run man to man occasionally, but uh, he is playing a lot of snaps for the Jets. That I think they really want him to be good because <laughs> he is so athletic. I kind of hoping that with good coaching and with his athleticism, it just kind of works eventually. Every week he plays and isn't a liability for this defense. I'll give him a little bit of credit, but I just, I don't know if he's a long-term answer or not. Certainly has the athletic upside to be that. And then Ashton Davis, just, it's time to lower him, man. He was a really good prospect coming out of California, but he hasn't been that in the NFL now for, for both years. He's dealt with some injuries, but when he's out there, he just, he isn't showing the range, the, the plays on the ball, the run defender, he's just been average, so... I like Ashton Davis. I think he can still have a, a bright future ahead, but it hasn't been there so far. Then the Measley Lions. I am going to lower Jared Goff. Just not pushing the ball downfield, not making enough plays. You're seeing him, you know, removed from the Rams system that opens up a lot of things for him. There's not a lot of explosiveness there. I still think he's a starting caliber player, and he is in a remarkably difficult spot, but he's not making it any better on himself, just like Dan Campbell said. Uh, these receivers, Quintez Cephas, continues to catch everything thrown his way. I like him a lot. Even if he doesn't have a lot of upside, he's he's just a very good NFL player. Amon Ross St. Brown, you know, we lowered him in like week four or whatever because he wasn't a big part of the offense. And ever since then, he's he's become the offense. Get, getting open, uh, not named DeAndre Swift, I should say. Uh, but getting open, coming out of the ball, showing some toughness. Uh, you know, he's, he was a good, good mid-round pick for them. And then Evan Brown, he's starting at center. 
and has been with Frank Reg now out. He's been okay. I'll just leave it at that. And then on the defensive side of the ball, Michael Brockers doesn't seem to be buying in here. He's just, he's given up ground up front. He's always been a really tough run defender. And I think that this could be heading for a, a breakup here because I, I really think it's just an effort thing for Michael Brockers. You go from the Rams, you get traded away and you're on the Lions now, and all of a sudden you're having the worst run defense grade of your career, it just makes too much sense to say that he just he, his heart's not in it here. So I wonder if maybe he, he might request a trade or something like that. Um, then you got Aleem McNeil. On the other hand, he is out there to prove it, and he is buying in. I, I loved Aleem McNeil coming out. I thought he was a bit of a steal for Detroit. And he's, he's just been a good like run defender up front. He's getting after the quarterback a little bit big, powerful, even a little bit of quickness in there. Uh, high upside defensive tackle that I am excited to see develop here. Then a lot of edge players kind of getting in the mix. They have a big old rotation up front. So you got Charles Harris earning more snaps week by week, former first round pick. He's got like, what, five sacks this year, a handful of, you know, 15, 20 pressures, good spin move. He's, he's just, you know, having a career resurgence here for Detroit. Uh, I'm curious, like, if he's going to get a new contract somewhere because you know we've seen former first round picks get um, refreshed very quickly in a situation like this so uh, good for him Austin Bryant been a good run defender is that edge piece as he was at Clemson and then Julian Aquara gets in there for a sack limited opportunities there for him but uh, we've seen his brother have a very fast track developing career and uh, maybe that's in play here for Julian and then we got Jerry Jacobs, you know, whatever, but did make some plays in week six. Uh, looked competent at corners. So we'll continue to monitor that. I don't know the first thing about Jerry Jacobs. I think he was on my draft board of 74 corners, but maybe not. Uh, that's how low, lowly he was. And then Tracy Walker, he's had a bit of a roller coaster career. Came into the league hot. Late Matt Patricia era, really struggled. Now getting back to really good tackling, decent range up there as, as the free safety and I like Tracy Walker probably in a contract year I think this is your four for him so uh, could be due for a, a payday for Detroit now the Green Bay Packers a lot of kind of under the radar guys stepping up with all the injuries they're dealing with but it's uh, the big name guys kind of carrying the load as well so you got both running backs I do think this deserves to be mentioned with Dallas at least for the best running back duo so Aaron Jones you know, I, I was critical of this signing, but uh, for him to be playing his best football after you pay him, that's at least a plus. Like he is, he is making guys miss. He's having, uh, you know, creating explosive runs, and just he looks outstanding. And his ability in the, in the receiving game continues to grow. And then AJ Dillon has been that upgrade to Jamal Williams that they hope for. He he just he brings that same toughness and grittiness. And ability to catch the ball out of the backfield, frankly, but he brings it with more explosiveness and power. Uh, so this is a beautiful one-two punch here in a great scheme for these guys. And then you throw in Mercedes Lewis on top of the run game here. I mean, he's going up mostly because he continues to be perhaps the best run-blocking tight end in the NFL with George Kittle out currently. And then actually making plays in the receiving game, making really fun like run-after catches uh, showing some power, some stiff arm, even juked a guy. Now, he's not going to be a consistent contributor in the receiving game, and he's not like winning one-on-ones, but when he does what he does in the run game, which is just elite stuff, teams just forget about him, and he sneaks out, and then if he's good with the ball in his hands, and he's tough to tackle, like that's an asset to the Packers. Then you got Devontae Adams, just continues his ascension, uh, winning in so many different ways, catching the ball over the middle of the field, run after catch, elite, getting open deep, like just, he's the best receiver in football. Maybe not the most valuable because Tyree Kill exists, but the best, you know, from a skill set perspective and growing. And he's playing pissed off too because he wants that contract. Uh, then the offensive linemen, these young guys, uh, Yasuo Nishman has been put to the bench now because you've got Elton Jenkins comes back and David Bakhtiari's back, but he played so valiantly at left tackle. It's good for Green Bay to know they have a young player that has a lot of athleticism that can hold up uh, against the Nick Boses of the world. And then John Runyon, I think he's here to stay. Probably gets bumped over to right guard with Elton Jenkins coming back. But 
that could be a huge upgrade for this offensive line, getting David Bakhtiari back. You're not just getting better at one spot. You're actually getting better at three spots because Elton Jenkins goes back to left guard, and then you're able to put John Runyon in at right guard, uh, replacing the one player that hasn't been going up in this series, uh, the rookie there out of Ole Miss. Uh, so John Runyon going up, been a, just a very sound pass protector. And then Lucas Patrick, another just depth piece here. Josh Myers had a hard time staying on the field the last couple weeks, and Patrick has stepped in and been a very serviceable pass protector at center. So a lot of guys stepping up on offense, and then guys stepping up on defense. So Eric Stokes, plus one, uh, just holding on. He's had some really tough assignments. Uh, he went really you know, punch for punch with Jamar Chase. Jamar Chase certainly got his, as you would expect, but I still think that was a really impressive performance. He had a couple pass breakups and was really hanging in there down the field. I've been very impressed by Eric Stokes. Uh, You know, opposing quarterbacks have been going after him and he's had some really good plays and he's had, you know, he's gotten beat just as the cornerback position is. But for a first round pick, I think he's doing about as well as you can ask for. Then uh, Devondre Campbell, I mean, my goodness, uh, credit to Brian Gutekunst for this find. Um, man, he's he's been PFF's best linebacker in the NFL. And he's been the best linebacker the Packers have had, I I don't know, since Ray Nitschke. I mean, it's been just night and day what he's he's been able to do here. He doesn't miss tackles. He gets depth in his drops. He doesn't always bite the cheese on play action. Um, just everything you could ask for from a, a modern linebacker. He's fast. He's got... Uh, borderline four or five speed he can get to the sideline just what a pickup just like Aaron Rodgers said like it, it, they were stunned that he was available they went and got him and um, man he, he's due for a payday uh, plus five 70 to a 75 definitely a star of the week candidate uh, Jonathan Garvin's been playing solid on the edge he was a seventh round pick out of Miami uh, just a role player as is Henry Black but both those guys have have stepped up uh, in their roles um, Panthers are going to drop down um, Sam Darnold here, 74 to a 73. Three really bad weeks in a row, looking like more like his old self. And uh, yeah, we're, we're just going to continue to evaluate Sam Darnold. He's played some good football. He's played some bad football. Uh, he needs a better offensive line, and, and it's hurt that they don't have Christian McCaffrey in there too. But it's not all him. Robbie Anderson's going to go down uh, two. I thought about making him the dud of the week. I mean, Robbie Anderson's 2020 season is a total outlier on his career. I mean, he was very consistent last year, um, but a guy that's always kind of struggled with drops, hasn't always been the most physical player, not necessarily the best route runner either. He's just kind of lengthy and fast. And man, he's he's not been good this year. He's been a okay number two, but that's, that's not what he was rated as coming off of last season. So he's been a disappointment. And Matt Paradise is going to go down as well. Uh, honestly, just to, he's very similar to... Uh, what we said about um, uh, Graham Glasgow, who went to Denver, but ever since Paradise left Denver, I don't know if it's scheme or coaching or whatever, he, he went from all pro caliber or at least pro bowl caliber center to, you know, replacement level guy. So he's been living off of his reputation as a Bronco for way too long. He, he's been having a really bad year this year, by far the worst in his career, but he wasn't good last year for them either. A decent run blocker, but man, he's, uh, he's given up some pressures on the inside. Uh, so Darnold's not been good. He's not getting a ton of help either. Uh, the, some guys are playing well. Chuba Hubbard is stepping up at running back. He's not Christian McCaffrey, but uh, he looks a little bit more like his 2019 self that was a potential first-round pick. I don't know if he's quite as explosive, but you know he can break some arm tackles. He's got good vision. He's decent in the receiving game. Uh, at least a very good backup, but I, I do think he has like starting upside too. Uh, then the, the two tight ends are playing well. Ian Thomas, after I kind of obliterated him, first couple weeks, uh, he's kind of fighting for his NFL livelihood, honestly. I mean, he has some athleticism, and he's got some strength. He's putting it to the to the test a little bit more as a run blocker. He had that big 40-yard com- uh, reception to set up overtime against the Vikings. So he's playing well. And then Tommy Tremble really buying into his role as a blocker. And uh, these two guys are in a bit of a competition right now, and they're both playing pretty well. Uh, competition breeds excellence, and this is another example of it. Then on the defensive side of the ball, Frankie Levu, uh, rotational, weak side, hybrid backer, uh, actually being really impressive as a blitzer. They have so many different pieces that I think the scheme really helps him, but he's getting after it. And then 
super pleasant surprise here with all of the cornerback movement for this team. Quietly, Keith Taylor has slipped in and played really good football for them. Lengthy six foot two corner coming out of Washington, which is a cornerback factory. I mean, it, it it's still early and it's just been a couple of games, but man, he is he has been incredibly stable, not giving up big plays, deflecting passes, getting in, in the way of, of receivers. I mean, if he's good, you add in the other corners that this team has acquired, uh, CJ Henderson, Stephon Gilmore, you get JC Horn back. Uh, that's not even mentioning uh, Jackson. Man, so many corners here. And then Sean Chandler, not a cover player, but he has actually been a, a just crazy consistent tackler for this, excuse me, for this defense. So getting some credit for that. Then we got the New England Patriots. So some love to go around for this offense. Mac Jones has actually been playing really solid football. As I've said, you know, he looks like a five-year vet. Navigates the pocket well, attacks the middle of the field, super accurate. I, I, I would say he's doing more than you would think he, he would be able to with a beat-up offensive line and these receivers. Uh, but Damian Harris continues to just be a very solid, powerful, bruising back. Jacoby Myers is going to go up 174 to a 75. Just a savant in the middle of the field. Tough dude that can find holes in zones and is on a good page with Mac Jones. Uh, strange, he does not have a touchdown in his career on, you know, I don't know, 150 catches or something like that. Then you got Michael Unwenu stepping back out, playing right tackle, just kicking dude's ass. I mean, this guy is remarkably consistent as a run blocker. I still think he's a, he's better off as a guard because he has shown weaknesses as, as a, a pass protector in certain matchups. But to know that he can play guard, hold his own in pass pro, and still just kick dude's ass as a run blocker, incredibly valuable for the Patriots, given their injury situation. Uh, we talked about how they'd be better off moving him to tackle with how bad the backups have been there, and it was a good move for them. Offense has been playing better the last couple weeks. As for the defense, you know, you got some veterans here that are truly regressing, I would say. You got Lawrence Guy getting up there in age. It wasn't as good last year. was curious if this was age regression or um, maybe a lack of effort. You know, run defense is uh, tough to play when you're not winning a lot of games. So it could be a little bit of that. But he's also on the other side of 30 now. So he is truly regressing. Devin McCourty said it himself that he's regressing. And same deal last year is was, was a down year. At 33 years old, it was assumed it's because of age, but wasn't terrible. But this year, he just he's been nowhere to be found. He's out there saying, like, I feel old. This feels like it's heading towards a very fast retirement situation uh, for Devin McCourty. Uh, so hats off to a amazing career for Devin McCourty, but it does feel like this is done, and he could continue to fall very quickly here if we see more of this. And then Jonathan Jones, you know, he's not necessarily age regression here, but I think he's role regressing. He's been uh, able to be used as much more of a matchup corner in more favorable situations for his skill set. Not so much with all these injuries in the secondary, uh, getting rid of Gilmore now, and he hasn't been able to hold up um, consistently for the Patriots. So a lack of talent in the secondary, I think, is, is certainly hurting this Patriots defense. Now the John Gruden-less Las Vegas Raiders, Henry Ruggs, Whoo, man, his ability to go and get the ball downfield is really helping this Raiders offense. He's always had speed and ability to separate, but paired with a Derek Carr that's playing more aggressive and Henry Ruggs playing with the confidence to attack the football and come down with it down the field, uh, it, it's opened up the top of this offense. Let's, let's leave it at that. Uh, it's been big for these guys. Uh, Colton Miller, he's a pass-blocking savant. He's been nothing but a solid rock for uh, Derek Carr's blind side now for about 20 straight games, heading up towards that, honestly, like David Bakhtiari territory if he continues this trajector, uh, trajectory. Uh, then you got Max Crosby. Whew, man. Um, we could spend no time on this because he's been very well documented or we could spend 10 minutes on this, but it's it's been the biggest surprise in the NFL this year is Max Crosby... You know, going from rotational borderline like number two guy to holy crap, like is he as good as the best edge rushers in the league? Good. He, he is dominating. He's on a historic pace. Uh, you know, there's only been three or four players in the history of PFF grading that have had over a hundred pressures, and he's on pace for a hundred and fifteen. He's winning with power. He's winning with finesse. 
He's contributing better in the run game. He's deflecting passes. He's doing everything you could possibly ask for a top elite pass rusher. And if he sustains, I think it's a contract year for him too. Like, holy, holy crap. Like, he's going to get so much money if he keeps playing like this. But at the same time, like, is that a tough decision for the Raiders? Like, do you pay Max Crosby $130 million uh, off of one season? It's it's going to be tough. It's going to be a hot topic, I think, in the offseason. Um, but, man, he's playing great. Uh, then uh, secondary, playing surprisingly well as well. Nate Hobbs, oh, he's, he's fun, man. He's quick. He's smart. He's, uh, he's making, like, these nifty tackles as the slot corner but just very comfortable. You know, he played that cover two defense for Illinois, so he spent a lot of time around the line of scrimmage, but more on the outside defending those flat zones. But I think that's translated to his zone coverage from the slot. It's a very similar skill set. Uh, so just a very solid slot corner and, and growing in a lot of upside too. Then the safeties, looking like a good duo in this scheme. You got Trayvon Merrig, your classic Earl Thomas free safety role in the cover three defense that we see so much here. And uh, Jonathan Abram, who's playing that bandit linebacker strong safety role, the Cam Chancellor role, and both guys uh, just perfect fits in those systems. Uh, Merrig has a, a pick this week against Teddy Bridgewater. Jonathan Abram, the same. Uh, it was a real interception, too. You know, he kind of um, was – I noticed this. I watched this game in All-22, and uh, they were really daring Jonathan Abram in that kind of curl-flat zone – and they kept kind of throwing over the top of him while keeping his eyes to the flat. And uh, they were throwing these little, you know, 10-yard hitch routes over the top of Abram all game. But late in the game, Abram finally was like, enough of this. And he got enough depth and he picked it off. It was a really good play by Jonathan Abram, a very aware play, who's having his best season. So he's settling in in that part of the field, right? You don't want him deep. He gets murdered <laughs> deep in the field. But you put him down where he can work in shorter areas, and he's a fine player. So um, Jonathan Abram, plus one and, and growing. All right, home stretch, LA Rams, Daryl Henderson carrying the load for this, this run game. You know, he's not as fast as I thought he was coming out of Memphis, but very good vision and contact balance, and uh, they haven't missed uh, much of a beat in that run game, thanks to Daryl Henderson and the blocking up front and the scheme and all that, but Henderson's been good. Then you got Jonah Williams, out of nowhere contributor as a rotational DN has some juice off the ball and can muddy things up next to Aaron Donald as do Terrell Lewis and Ogbanya Akaronkwo they got a big rotation on the edge but both these guys getting after the quarterback a couple of sacks between them uh, the last few weeks I, I like Terrell Lewis and he's staying healthy he's got some upside and Ogbanya Okoronkwo can make some things interesting as well he's got great get off and bend off the edge so nice contributors there and then in the secondary, Robert Rochelle is stepping up an injury to Darius Williams there. So he's filling into that role, a, a rookie corner with a lot of athleticism, playing valiantly. And Taylor Rapp showing off the, the ball skills and the football IQ, baiting some interceptions. Uh, looking looking solid. I mean, he's not doesn't have a ton of range. He works really well in that kind of intermediate part of the field where his range isn't as exploited. But this, this cover four system allows him to work in that part of the field, especially when they get him going on these like buzz zones and cover three too. So yeah, he's a, he's a good player. Just not a ton of upside because he, he really isn't all that fast, but very smart, very physical. Then the Baltimore Ravens, Lamar Jackson, all these, so many young quarterbacks getting like massive boosts, playing such good football. We're usually a little slower with these quarterbacks, but these guys are really shooting up. And that gap between your guys like Russ and, you know, Watson's sure. And, and even like Rogers, it's narrowing very quickly um, with guys like Lamar and Dak and Kyler. And yeah, there's a long list, Josh Allen. Uh, but yeah, Lamar is right there, man. He, we've talked a lot about him. You can check out my uh, video last week about talking about him unlocking all the infinity stones, getting the accuracy stone and the pocket presence stone. Been a huge part to unlock, you know, him being a full, well-rounded passer, just attacking the deep parts of the field outside the numbers much more efficiently. And having a much more comfortable balance of when to hang in the pocket and when to scramble. Those have been my two big criticisms of Lamar Jackson. He's clearly worked on those things. And man, he's he's right there with Kyler Murray in the MVP race. So plus two for Lamar. Latavius Murray's going to go down. You know, he's producing, but he doesn't look all that explosive to me. 
Let me know, Ravens fans, what you think. He hasn't been all that impressive. He's been fine, but it doesn't quite look like the same guy that was uh, a really good bruiser for the, the Saints for a couple years. Then for the offensive line, uh, Ben Powers has, I think, won that left guard spot from Ezra, uh, from Ben Cleveland. I think the, the pass protection he brings to the table uh, is just a little more valuable than Cleveland's run blocking ability. So uh, Powers has been very stable, just like he was at Oklahoma. Needed a little bit of time in the NFL to put on some, some play strength and, and get up to speed, but he looks solid. The Ravens are so good at developing these guys. It's, it's taken a little bit of time to get a guy like Powers uh, and Patrick McCarry here to fill in consistently. Uh, but I think Powers is the guy moving forward. And then Patrick McCarry at right tackle. This has been kind of a blessing for them because uh, Villanueva was really bad at right tackle, looked really uncomfortable. He's been a little bit better at left. And uh, McCarry looks like a better right tackle than Villanueva was. Makari is interesting. He's played really good center for this team. I think he was a college tackle. It kicked inside. Um, but out of desperation, they play Makari out there, and he's held up very well. Uh, so he's an, a very intriguing kind of Ravens lineman that I will be curious to see if maybe when hopefully Stanley gets back here eventually, do they stick with Makari as, as maybe the long-term answer at right tackle. Uh, someone to keep an eye on there for sure. Mark Andrews balling out, playing as good as he was in 2019 and better. He's been the second best tight end in the NFL this year. I know Darren Waller's had a, a, a fast start, but Waller's tapered off, and Mark Andrews the last two, three weeks has been Gronkian, I would say, like prime Gronkian, very similar. Uh, similar athleticism to get open over the middle of the field is prime Gronk. The ball skills, elite and Mark Andrews blocking better than he ever has. He has been unbelievable. So I think it's time. Let's throw Mark Andrews into that tight end two debate with Kittle, who just can't stay healthy, Waller, and Mark Andrews now. I, I think that's that's fair. Then we got Eric Tomlinson, uh, also at tight end. He's He's been Nick Boyle for them, going back to last year and, and even this year. I mean, he just has that tough, like punch you in the face, blocking tight end mentality, and he's been such a great find for them. Then you got on the defensive side of the ball, Calais Campbell's back to playing elite run defense up front. I don't have a great reason for why it wasn't there last year, but it's been noticeable. I mean, uh, just watch the game against Denver or week six against the, the Colts. Like, He's he's holding his ground. He's getting off blocks. He's he's making stops at the line of scrimmage that just weren't there last year. Uh, so for whatever reason, Calais Campbell is is kind of back. And God, he's he's a Hall of Famer, Calais Campbell at this point. Like to have another resurgence at 34 years old, like, or even I mean, 36. Like he is so old, but he's still so good. He's such a freak. Uh, then we got Adafe. Oh wait, talk about freaks. I mean, he's putting it to use in run defense. Um, you know, he's, he's had some nifty sacks, but really it's it's been just playing physical, disciplined, tough run defense up front that's been a, a very, very nice uh, addition through the draft for the Ravens, and he's just getting started. Then the New Orleans Saints, uh, James Hurst, one of the more fascinating players that I want to talk about here in this video, because this is a unique situation for a lot of reasons. Let's start with James Hurst, who's been a rock at left tackle. Teron Armstead has not been able to go for them. And James Hurst has actually a very impressive resume. He has not been viewed as a starter by the league, but I think it's time. So you really go back the last four years, he's stepped in at right tackle, he's stepped in at guard, he's played left tackle now for the Saints, he's stepped in everywhere, and he's actually been a very sound pass protector everywhere he's been. Right now he's, he's playing at a, a high-end starting level. I don't wanna say elite, but like he's playing at a great level at left tackle. He's 29 years old. He's actually younger than Armstead. He came into the league as an undrafted free agent in 2014 out of NC State, and he's done nothing but develop since. So you look at Armstead at 30 years old. Um, I'm going to spoil this. Next week, I'm going to have a, a trade a trade show for the podcast, really, um, talking about potential trades. Armstead wouldn't be the biggest surprise if he's on the move. Whether it's a trade or they let him go in free agency, I, I don't know, but Hurst has played it well enough for somebody to make him a starting tackle, and he could be a lot cheaper than Armstead. 
and might give them 90% of the play if he keeps this up. So this is a, a situation really to keep an eye on. Hurst has really impressed me. Um, and that's why it's so interesting. On the other hand, uh, Andrews Pete sucks. Uh, he, I noticed that um, they ended up putting a different left guard in. I don't know if Pete got injured or benched. I kind of missed that. But Pete's been the single worst pass protector in the NFL this year. Pass block win rate of 80% this week against, uh, was it Washington? Um, yeah, man, just, just awful, awful play. That was week five uh, against Washington. And I, I, ugh, I, I don't get it. I don't get it with Andrews Pete. Then we got Shy Tuttle, plus one, just solid run fence. The Saints are super good at finding these guys. They seem to have maybe found another one in Montrevious Adams, so they picked up. Uh, off the street when Green Bay let him go. Carl Granderson, undrafted pickup, rotating kind of inside and out of that line, uh, doing a little bit of everything. Just really good rotational pieces there. They got Pete Werner, second round pick, playing outstanding linebacker for them. The coverage has been solid, run defense, tackling, balanced player. Uh, great mentor next to him and Demario Davis. Might be a long-term replacement there, Pete Werner. Good second round pick, it looks like. And then Marshawn Lattimore, he's been the best um, cornerback in the NFL so far. We know he's capable of it. I mean, he did it probably as a rookie <laughs> and hasn't gotten back to that level, but he's playing like rookie Marshawn Lattimore. They paid him um, rightfully so a ton of money and he's he's paying him back. So uh, one of the best weeks from a corner you'll ever see against Washington week five. He had six pass deflections going against a receiver in Terry McLaurin. So huge week for Lattimore. He's been unbelievable. You know, every year we get a new CB1, right? It was Gilmore, then it was Jair last year. Uh, Ramsey's always kind of hovered around that level too, but Marshawn Lattimore's making a case this year. Uh, and then just a couple notes, Deontay Harris, he played two snaps. One of them was like an 80-yard touchdown. They got to play him more. I mean, he is super explosive. They just got to trust that he's going to get open and make plays for them, even though he's 5'7", but a really fun player. I think he is the best receiver on their team currently until Michael Thomas gets back. Uh, Paulson Adebo also had a beautiful interception. You know, I talked about after the first couple weeks, he wasn't grading out particularly well, but he passed the eye test to me. Really tough, uh, really tough couple of weeks though for Adebo, but uh, you know, held it down against Washington. A great pick, got his head around tight coverage, and I, I want to see a little bit more before I bump him back up. But Paulson Adebo definitely passes the eye test. He was one of my biggest sleepers in this draft. Um, but I want to also make sure I'm not being biased uh, you know, towards him because he has had some couple of bad weeks. Uh, I know I really like him. Had a great week this week. Uh, let's see him uh, repeat moving forward. Seattle Seahawks here. Geno Smith playing valiantly. Excited to see him actually in another primetime game. Uh, just, you know, running the offense. Decent arm. Decent athlete. Not the best decision maker, but uh, he, could, he could carve out a decent, you know, role as that Fitzpatrick level kind of journeyman backup. I, I could see it. Uh, he's fun. Alex Collins is also very fun. Uh, he's back here in Seattle, and, and when he's a Seattle Seahawk, he's a very good running back. He's quick. He's got good vision. He breaks tackles. Uh, he's been a nice replacement for uh, Carson, who's who's injured. Damian Lewis is going to come down. Um, you know, he's, he had an outstanding rookie season as a run blocker, but I've talked about this many times. Those that have been around this series know that Damian Lewis is not a good pass protector. He's terrible, clunky feet, uh, shorter arms. Like he can really struggle in pass protection and that's showing up, but you're also not getting that elite level run blocking that you got as a rookie. So he's gonna come down too. I still like his future, but he has gotta refine and figure out a way to, to not be a liability as a pass protector. Uh, Kyle Fuller has played center. I'll say that he's not good, but he hasn't been a complete liability. Um, and then Jamal Adams, talk about liability. I mean, what a bad trade for the Seahawks. Everyone's, everyone's, you know, pointing it out how he's not been good in coverage, but look no further than, you know, I think it was Tyler Higby beat him for that touchdown in the red zone. Just no contest. Like he wasn't even anywhere close. And that's, that's far from the only time Jamal Adams has been beaten coverage this year. And he hasn't even been the same elite level run defender that he always is. So coming down two for Jamal Adams, definitely one of the duds of the year. Could have been dud of, dud of, the, dud of the week as well. Maybe he should have been, but um, yeah, minus two, 88 to an 86 and yikes. 
Then we got the Pittsburgh Steelers. A lot of players here, so let's keep it moving. Najee Harris going up plus one, producing super well. First round pick, ultra talented dude. Doesn't get the best blocking in front of him, but he does help this offense move the ball. Uh, change in the tight end room. Eric Ebron has lost the job to Pat Fryermuth. Uh, you know, myself and others kind of predicted this to happen, but I was particularly high in Pat Fryermuth. I had a true first round grade on him, and I thought he was a total steal for the Steelers in the second round. And just taking Eric Ebron's job up and underneath him, like already by week six, he, he does everything. Better blocker, better receiver, better hands, better after the catch, you name it. Uh, I love Pat Fryermuth. He's got a bright future ahead of him. Uh, tight end Zach Gentry as well as get involved as a blocker. So he's going to go up. And then Dan Moore stepping in at left tackle. He's been okay. Not, not a, amazing, but for a rookie, he's playing valiantly. You got four players going up on the defensive line. You know, Wormley, Loudermilk kind of just uh, rotational run defenders playing well. Uh, Wormley's playing more of that starting role with two it out, but um, Cam Hayward is having his best season. And, and that's impressive considering TJ Watt was out for a while and he doesn't have two it next to him. So for him to show that he's not a product of, of, you know, single teams and having really good guys around him, like he just is that good. He's having his best year as a run defender and as a pass rusher. Um, man, he, he's been outstanding and needs to needs to get the recognition as, as you know, one of the best defensive players in the NFL. He's, he's unbelievable. Um, but then Henry Mondo had a really fun spin move sack showing off some quickness on the inside. Undersized guy, not a run defender, but they're using him a little bit as a situational pass rusher. Then in the defense, a lot of under the radar players playing well, while as their big name guys are not playing well. So James Pierre has kind of taken that starting corner job, I think. He's playing just solid football. Nothing noticeably amazing, but he hasn't been a liability for them. Uh, and then Trey Norwood, I, I gave him a shout out on the podcast this week. I thought he was terrible coming out of Oklahoma. I didn't think he could cover anything. And he's been solid. You know, he's running with crossing routes, showing a little more speed than I thought he had. He's been good as a kind of um, dime corner. And yeah, credit where credit's due. He's, he's surprised me. Same with Arthur Mallette. He's been a very good slot corner for them. And the Steelers just, they crank out these guys, right? You got Mike Hilton, Cam Sutton is their main guy. And then Arthur Mallette comes in and takes Cam Sutton's role from last year. He plays really well. Uh, so yeah, I mean, he's he's been doing everything for them and uh, breaking up passes, you name it, and ascending very quickly as a slot corner to keep an eye on. Uh, that said, Joe Hayden, Getting up there in age still, you know, he's just hanging out, doing doing what he can, but he is getting beat. Time to come down a little bit. And then Minka Fitzpatrick too, man. We jumped, as a football community, we jumped to some very dangerous conclusions with Minka Fitzpatrick, I think. I think the standard was set way too high for him. He had five picks the second the Pittsburgh Steelers traded for him, and all of a sudden he was an elite safety, and that's just, that's been so far from what he's been since those first like three weeks as a Steeler. He is, if you want to be completely honest, he is out of position a lot. He is a risk taker and this year he has not guessed correctly and he's guessed wrong. He has not touched the football this year and he's been giving up touchdowns. He has not played well. He's been a, one of the worst safeties in the NFL so far, um, especially given his expectations. So he has to play better. I think he's capable of it, but it's just another reminder that you have to be careful with interception stats, especially when they're as fluky as the ones that Minka Fitzpatrick did. I actually have a video on it. If you want to go back, I, I said it like, I think it was the week he got his fifth interception. I I said, I was like, be careful. Like these are really lucky interceptions and that, has, that could have not aged any better than it has. I also have a note on Alex Highsmith who had a really big game against the Seahawks. And uh, we'll keep an eye on that. He's he's rated as a 74, which is a good rating for him given a limited sample size. But uh, he's had a, a more of a down year this year compared to last year, but a really good game this week against the Seahawks. Could be due for a boost if uh, he keeps that up in his role. Okay, three more teams to do. We got the Houston Texans here. So Davis Mills, plus one, playing okay. He's not the future. Okay, let's move on. Uh, David Johnson, just washed up, man. Simply put, loses a fumble this week. I... I don't know, I could see a David Johnson retirement either during the season or after the season. Mark Ingram, on the other hand, is having a nice little resurgence here. He's running really tough. Uh, he's been kind of the 
heart and soul, I think, of that offense. Uh, and I'm not going to say putting the team on his back, but uh, doing what he can with, with that team. These receivers, Chris Moore made a huge play against the Patriots. Probably just a flash in the pan, but was certainly a physically impressive play to see him go up, elevate for the ball, break a tackle, score a big touchdown. Uh, then you got Nico Collins kind of getting his first serious looks now and, um, you know, stepping in, playing well. It was a Mike Williams comp coming out and lucky for Nico Collins. Mike Williams is playing unbelievable this year. And I still think that he's capable of being that really good, you know, number two receiver with a big body. And yeah, good, good kind of first couple weeks for Nico Collins. The, the Texans really targeted him. They traded up uh, to get him when they needed a lot of youth and, and they sacrificed a lot to get him. So uh, that's, that's big. Then you got the offensive line, a couple of, you know, low level guys playing okay. Jerron Christian, Charlie Heck uh, starting at right tackle. I don't know if Cannon's hurt or if they just want to see what Heck can do as a mid-round draft pick for them with some potential. Uh, Texans fans, let me know if you're watching this part. <laughs> um, Jonathan Grenard has been a very, very pleasant surprise. I wasn't a big Grenard guy coming out, but he's shown some pass rush moves, some size and toughness against the run. They might have something in him as a number two rusher off the edge. And then some veteran corners, Tavier Thomas, with a lot of speed playing in the slot there, playing pretty solid. Uh, he's got some upside late in his career here out of some small school that I can't remember right now. And then Vernon Hargraves is actually playing really good football in this cover two system. You know, it's a pretty simplified role there. Uh, this team really does run as much cover two as you would think. And uh, he uses that short area quickness to his advantage. Um, so I don't know if it's just scheme being a good fit for him or if he at he's only 25 years old, believe it or not. Uh, so it's possible that he's, you know, clicking into place late in his career. Uh, former first round pick. Uh, but yeah, he's having a nice year. Then the Tennessee Titans. So we, we talked about Derrick Henry. We don't need to do that. But Jeremy McNichols, what a perfect compliment with how he's playing. You know, Henry is a one-trick pony. He is useless in the receiving game. But hey, Jeremy McNichols can do enough as a runner to be a, a bit of a threat. Uh, but really sound hands, good route running, speed after the catch. He's been a very nice find as a third down back for them. Uh, and certainly a surprise. And then Kari Blossom game, getting some respect, clearing the way for uh, Derrick Henry. He's been playing really good football. Nick Westbrook Akine, I gave him a shout out on the podcast this week. He had a beautiful block to spring Derrick Henry free on that big 70 yard touchdown run or whatever it was against the Bills. But he's been decent as a receiver too. He's been a nice surprise for them. David Kisenberry is going to get a huge boost actually, plus five. I was kind of, um, I think I just like missed on this because he's been starting for the majority of the season at right tackle. Not Dylan Radunes, not uh, the other guy that they picked up from Cleveland. No, it's been David Kissenberry. He's a really good athlete, 31 years old, uh, but he's he's been an outstanding run blocker. He's been a big part of Derrick Henry's success, certainly. And uh, I, I'm curious what how they view his long-term outlook here. And um, they're going to need more help at tackle, I think, Luan. I don't, I don't know how quickly he's going to bounce back from my, hopefully just a concussion there. But yeah, they've been a kind of turnstile at tackle, but the guys they plug in play well, and Kessenberry's next in line. Then on the defense, Harold Landry, you know, 35 pressures already this year. He's been he's been all over the place. His, uh, his grade, his PFF grade's only like 65 because a lot of it is on stunts, and he's so quick that Sometimes he just kind of walks into these free rushes and stuff. Uh, and he also has some worse reps because he doesn't have a ton of strength. But, you know, he's he's winning as a rusher, and he's he's been a problem for quarterbacks. He's been all over the place. So plus one, 79 to an 80. Titans are going to have to make a difficult decision on how much he's worth and if, he, if they need to pay him a max, you know, edge contract, if he has a 15-sack season. Um, then you got Rashawn Evans, certainly just – not a modern linebacker, can't cover, he's struggling in space, missing more tackles than he ever has. I don't think Titans fans are going to disagree with that one. And then in the secondary, this group is really shaping into place despite the Farley injury, and that's where the Farley injury is so unfortunate. But Elijah Molden has really settled in. A bit of a slow start, but he's been he's been all over the place the last few weeks. Christian Fulton is just having a very solid season. I thought he was a first-round caliber corner, 
last year and now getting full-time opportunity is in a great system for him where they run a lot of match coverages and man situations where he's very comfortable. Uh, so even if Farley's out, you have Fulton playing really well. Um, Jack Rabbit's not going to get a boost, but he's been playing really good football the last few weeks. Chris Jackson is a year two kind of, you know, uh, multiple hybrid corner. He can play some slot, play outside. He ended up having to actually step outside and play outside corner against the Bills and held up against that great receiving course. So they may have found something, a seventh round pick out of Marshall last year. Nice depth. And then Kevin Bayard is back, man. That's been a huge boost for this defense. Uh, pick in back-to-back -back weeks, right? I know he had one against the Bills. Uh, but yeah, this is a guy that just a year ago was viewed as potentially the best safety in the NFL. Really a down year last year, surrounded by complete and utter garbage on this defense in a COVID season with, with the highest offense we've ever seen. And now he's back looking like the old Kevin Byard. So uh, probably needs a little bit more credit there. Kevin Byard, best player on that defense, playing really well. And then Amani Hooker is a safety I really like. He's not getting a boost this week because I already rate him as a 72 with given his you know, resume, it's pretty respectable, but a really good game against the Bills and certainly will be due for a boost if uh, he keeps playing like that. And like I said, that secondary is shaping into place. Okay, deep breath. This is our last team, the Minnesota Vikings. So another fullback getting some love, CJ Ham. It's funny that Kari Blassing game is one of the best fullbacks in the NFL, and the reason he became available to the Titans from Minnesota is because CJ Ham was ahead of him. Ham is is also a great lead blocker. He had like a 30-yard run against um, last week, which was Detroit, right? Yeah, Detroit was last week. Yeah, big run, and then the receivers playing really well. No, Panthers was this week. Was yeah, sorry, they're both light blue teams. Getting a little mixed up. But yeah, CJ Ham, I'm pretty sure it was against the Panthers at a 30-yard run. Anyway, Justin Jefferson, he's so good, dude. He he does everything. Absolutely everything. He's got release. He tracks the ball at such a high level in those one-on-one -on -one situations. He can stack with speed on the outside. He's got great route running, run after the catch. I, I do believe he is in the top 10 wide receiver conversation already in year two. KJ Osborne has been awesome as well. He's been showing up every week in big moments. It feels like he's really good on these crossing routes. He's got some speed to separate over the middle of the field. He's got tough hands, run after catch ability. And we saw that against the Panthers. He had the game winning walk-off touchdown, uh, you know, came from the complete opposite side of the field, outran the corner, uh, outreached his uh, good reach to come out and grab the ball. And then good ability to turn up field and convert for the touchdown. So KJ Osborne, really good development here for the Vikings, kind of out of nowhere. No one saw this coming. And then for the defense, this defense is really playing good football uh, quietly. And it starts up front, man. You got James Lynch, who I loved. I loved this pick when they got him. Uber productive pass rusher coming out of Baylor, but played edge at like 290 pounds. Coming inside, having to learn how to play interior defensive line. It's taken some time, but the last couple weeks, playing about 15 snaps, gets a sack here against the Panthers. And then Armin Watts as well, having great development on the inside. I just kind of finally all clicking in. He's, he's got a lot of athletic traits, but he's been playing run defense. He had a nice sack against the Panthers, able to force a fumble on Sam Donald on that one. Uh, so not only did they add Pierce and Tomlinson and Richardson, but they're getting Lynch and Watts to rotate in there and play really good. So they're super deep up front. You got uh, Everson Griffin going up plus two. He, he looks very close to, you know, maybe not prime Ever Everson Griffin, but he is clearly very comfortable playing for Mike Zimmer. Uh, he's been really getting after the quarterback. Everson, um, sorry, Daniil Hunter has been healthy and playing great. DJ Wanham playing great. Their front is getting very scary. Uh, Eric Kendrick's going to get his one overall point back. Two weeks ago, we lowered him because he had a really quiet start, and it, it really hurt me to do that. But gets a one-handed pick against the Lions. He starts tackling so much better. First two weeks, he missed six tackles. And then the four weeks since, he's only missed one. So uh, he's back to playing Eric Kendrick's football, which is a brand we approve of on that franchise guy. Uh, then Xavier Woods, Woods, really good pickup. I mean, frankly, he's been better than Anthony Harris was. Uh, for the last year for the Vikings. And uh, just a nice find there. Fits their scheme really well. And then uh, Christian Derrissaw getting a note. Not moving because he's well-respected uh, coming out in the first round. 
but big for the Vikings too to get him out there playing left tackle and holding up against a good Panthers pass rush. And that is it, 32 teams in the books. I really hope you guys enjoyed. Make sure you subscribe if you did. We'll be back next week with more NFL content. I appreciate you for watching. Please do hit that like button. Let me know in the comments down below if you think I missed or was wrong about any of these players in this video. And until next time, peace out. Peace out.